So you got you got to unmute yourself in the lower. Let's see the lower left. There you go. I got you. How you doing? Doing well. Doing well. And yourself? I'm exhausted. I've spent the last four days moving my entire house by myself. Oh man, that's yeah. And I've got pretty... and I've got the most important shit loaded in a car, so I can go north. Right. Yeah. Me and my that's little like... yeah, me and my little girl are moving to Minnesota. Okay, and, I, right and, on. I, and I started a job there November 4th. I'm going up there to get them and bring them back. We're going to have Yule down here, and it's right. going to be amazing. I guess, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, um, this surmises surmise for people. You and I have had several conversations as kind of a resource for each other concerning ideas of high mythological thought. And we've talked about recording these how many times now, just between you and I. And um, tonight was, um, you brought up a couple of days ago, the idea of, what was it again? The, uh, I don't understand, I don't remember what the Greeks call it. The um, Agatho Damon. That's the it. Yeah. yeah. That's it. My response to it was that yeah we have a we have a fetch, we have a weird, or not weird we have a fetch we have the desir we have the, the land whites, but the heathen context of it the fetch and this is from the theodish and if you want to know something specific about anything the theodish work it is, the fetch is one's guardian spirit is said to appear as an animal resembling one's disposition or as a member of the opposite sex which if corresponded to Jung's theories on the animus and the anime would resemble one's true love. If the fetch is seen as an animal, it will always be seen in that form unless the spellcaster wills it to shape change. In ancient times, fetches were generally seen as wolves, bears, cats, hawks, eagles, seafaring birds, livestock, horses, pigs, cattle. Its form can sometimes be seen with those with second sight. It is the fetch that usually controls the allocation of one's mane. Main is the is the might of your the, the, the spiritual energy of your being in accordance with one's weirds. Weird, your action has interactions with everyone else, the weird, the, the will. The fetch also records one actions in one's weird. If you steal a piece of jewelry that has a certain amount of a bearer's mane in it, that amount of your own mane will be sacrificed to keep things balanced. So there's, it becomes very complicated, but my response to, to this idea of the guardian spirit is, is to understand that we should deconstruct the most current element of it. And when, when they, when they sacrificed to Jesus, when they put him on the cross. And I don't think people understand Golgotha, the, the hill of the skull, the skull that's buried there is Adam's skull. So from the brow of Adam sprouts this tree of life. Mm. And, right. and when that is sacrificed, well, now it leaves people alone. And nobody wants to be alone. Nobody wants to go through the dark times the scary times, the, the times of heartbreak, they don't want to go through alone. And so in Christianity, what was left was the great comforter they called the Holy Ghost, to be filled with the Spirit. And that has succeeded for a while, but it's it's too vague, it's too nebulous, it's too out of our control, I think. So when you see, like I was saying, with Harry Potter and the Patronus or Star Wars and the Force, you're seeing something that's very much more in line with a guardian spirit that's like on our side. That's that's something that that believes in us when we might not. And I think that's the thing that most people, well, I don't know that most people, but I think in the toughest of times, everybody wants to know that there's somebody pulling for you. Everybody wants to know that you can, that, you know, I mean, what are the greatest scenes in movies when the hero's beaten and down and somebody extends a hand and says, come on, let's try again. That's right. what that guardian spirit is for. And you were talking about it, you know, when you had a dark moment in your time and there was something there that said, get up, give it a shot, try, here's what you do. 
And that's right. what we look for when we're talking about these things. Now, I have never heard that the Greeks had such an idea. I had no idea that they even had it. Yes, it's actually a very prominent concept. And interestingly enough, the Greeks had specific uh, and designated days of every month that they would designate and dedicate to the worship and devotion to specific deities. On the final day of the lunar month, for example, you have what is referred to as the Vipnon, or uh, the dinner, Ikati's dinner specifically. That day is dedicated to her, and it's also dedicated to essentially cleaning one's household and discarding uh, the old in preparation for the acceptance of the new and the things to come in the new month. And after that, you also have uh, the new moon, the celebration of the new moon, the worship of Zeus and Apollo and goddess Estia and these various deities. And then on that second day following that, you have the day that is dedicated to the Agatha Daemon. Then, like you pointed out, this is something that really permeates throughout multiple religions, multiple cultures, even in pop culture with things like Star Wars and Harry Potter, you have this fundamental idea that appeals to um, the mind that appeals to this commonality that we all possess in yearning for that transcendent and, and spiritual being that arrives to help us in these times of difficulty and darkness. And you see this just everywhere. And I was actually initially kind of hesitant to see those things in pop culture <laughs> because I think that like a lot of people are like, come on, you're talking about, you know, Harry Potter, Star Wars, come on, like what? But when you really look at it through the context of, say, Joseph Campbell, when he talks about exactly right. how these things are literally everywhere in our culture, all of these stories, all of these myths are expressions of these same fundamental ideas, you can truly see it in quite literally everything. And there's a certain beauty to that. But going back to the Greeks, um, they had that specific day that was designated to uh, the guardian spirit or the Agatha Damon. And granted, I'm not the absolute authority on this topic because it's something that I'm still learning about myself. But I will say that lately I've been really contemplating upon that. And it's beautiful because as you know, in Christianity, you have the concept of the Holy Spirit and how that is a comforter to you and guides you and provides you strength and resilience and affirmation, all these things. It's a very generalized idea and concept, but with the Greeks, um, the Greek writers and the Stoics specifically talk about how Zeus has designated a spirit to every person. And that spirit is with you, irrespective of what the circumstances are. And Epictetus in particular references how even if you are within a dark room, uh, to use a metaphor, your spirit still sees you. The gods still perceive you. You're never in a position where you're truly alone. And there is definitely just a remarkable beauty and comfort in that, for sure. I, I think in, uh, especially in this, especially right now with so much uncertainty being literally foisted upon all of society, there's a lot of people that need that. I mean, I would Absolutely. like, I, there's a part of me that sees people that, that need permission. They're just waiting for permission to tell them to go out and be great. But there's another, there's equally as many people that are just, you know, you got to wonder, is that the foundation of hope? Is that, is that, the, is that the spiritual manifestation of what hope would look like across, across, across time and mythological thought? Is that, I, I, you know, you, there's got to be something to that. I mean, who was it? The, the Stoic that said uh, hope is the opiate of the masses, but then it's such an integral part. But you said something there a minute ago about Hestia. She's one of these. I do know that she's one of these most powerful of goddesses, but never really talked about. She's one of the originals and she's the goddess of the hearth. Yes. You said the first thing they do is clean house mm -hmm. and then Absolutely. they begin to celebrate. There's a real powerful thing there. The Norns, there's two schools of thought. One is that there's just three. And then the other is that as a man is born, he or any individual comes to life, there's a norm associated with that. And they can have, they can be another person or another a spiritual entity of, of an individual or an elf or a dwarf. And they can be good or they can be evil if a person's life is full of bad lucks because they have a bad norm. But that, that concept of um, cleaning the hearth and cleaning and preparation that clearing away of the wreckage of the past is one of the surest ways to ensure that your ability to celebrate hope 
is going to be successful. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. I had, that's a that's a really neat idea. I don't know that we have something like that in 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 the Norse mythology and then also true. I'm I'm sure that it's got to be there. I just had to come across it, but that's that's a that's a real important. Well, I guess I could I could I could use Eager's Feast, which I'm so fond to do. But that you have all these collected gods and goddesses. Each one of them represents an attribute of an individual or a thought process. Or the powerful others are sitting there, all celebrating with each other, interacting with the divine as they do. You have one negative thought that comes in there and fucks it up. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's really interesting because if you look at this just from a purely empirical and scientific and psychological point of view, people really don't understand the significance and the power of your own thoughts. And that sounds very cliche. It's like, oh, of course, you know, people say that all the time, but truly mm -hmm. the capacity that we possess to create, like you've said, to create our reality, to create these circumstances that provide to us these opportunities. Uh, Marcus Aurelius said that the obstacle becomes the way. What you perceive, what you choose to see is what will be replicated within your own life. And I think that's one of the fundamental reasons why for us on the Deep Non, which is for me personally, one of the most absolutely significant celebrations that we have in the Hellenic tradition, it's so fundamentally important because when you take that physical action that is representative of a higher and transcendent spiritual action to clean uh, your room and your home and your car and to, to create and cultivate a new environment for yourself, one that is ordered, one that is harmonized, one that is pure, you are essentially creating a fundamental shift in consciousness to lay the foundation to make that stronger connection with the divine. And it's also interesting because, like I mentioned earlier, that particular celebration is dedicated to Igathi. And she is also, in addition to being uh, who we know as a divine motherly figure who guided Demetra through the underworld in search of Persephone and guided her by the light of her torch. She's the sacred torch bearer. I also refer to her as the Titaness of Transformations because I see Igathi as one of those powerful primordial divinities that brings to light that which is concealed, particularly um, hidden potential, <laughs> the cultivation of potential. And when you clear the way for that, you begin to see how all of these incredible and unprecedented transformations begin to occur in your life. And I'm speaking from, you know, my own experience in That's that what, regard. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the best amazing. thing to do. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's just I, really incredible. You know, I've noticed certain of the movements that I see that are prominent among um, in the masculinity industry, and it's the only thing I can really speak on, is is a is an avoidance of pain. Do you know right. what I mean? It seems like it's it's more than willing to address the faults of others before it is to address our own faults, and 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 and. And never really address the idea of how we're poisoning our own lives with the things we've been taught. You were talking about that, and all I could think of was that 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 quote of the, the illiterate people of the future will not be those who cannot learn new things, or who, who cannot read or write. It'll be those people who cannot unlearn and learn new things. And I and, and I think we really have, as a society, pushed ourselves against a wall where we're really being forced to unlearn some things to learn new things. And I wonder, I wonder how best would it be to, to, to promote these kind of ideas for people to cultivate a willingness to do, to, to do that clearing out of the wreckage of the past, to change our thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm 50. I'm struggling with it now in, in, in parts of my life, looking at the things that I, I had been taught. And, and, I'm, and it, it astounds me that they automatically default to the most negative connotations that are imaginable based upon the pains of my father and my grandfather. And in right. those situations, what I can do is fight, right? It's not conducive to being uh, compassionate or loving or vulnerable in particular. That's a real terrifying thing, especially for a man that's done things a certain way for so long. So I'm looking at all this now thinking, what is this 
why does that automatically default to that thought? That, so there's, I think there's a lot to that. I, and I think that as people find themselves in, in greater and greater need because of this horseshit that's going on in our society, they're going to begin to default to more and more negative thought processes. Do you see what I'm saying? So the things that we're talking about here, they've got to have, there's a relevance to them. I don't think we begin to understand yet or comprehend in, our, in the roles that we play in this. I mean, I, that's just kind of, maybe that's my own arrogance, but I, I feel pretty confident about it. I mean, there's some shit going on. The things that we're talking about, I mean, I mean, honestly, think about it, Sydney. I mean, here we are, two individuals that could not be worlds further apart. You know right. what I mean? And so we have both stumbled across a concept of, 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 of a real spiritual structure to the foundation of hope. Absolutely. And how best to, to promote that so that other individuals might grab a hold of it. I think that's the thing that's, that's, that's really resonating in my mind as we discuss this subject, how best to promote that. And I, and, and I think you absolutely you stumbled across it when you were talking about Hestia, clearing out the wreckage of the past. I mean, that's part of the thing. If you're, if you're I mean, Catholics do it. They have confessional. Right. And who knows how legitimate and how honest they are, but at least they're in there trying. At least they're in there trying, you know. I don't Absolutely. know. How you, I mean, it, it has become such a corrupt institution, um, but still, there's there's definitely that element of vulnerability, and it's fascinating because even in the Holy Nick myths, you see that as this this consistent theme, this motif that you see over and over and over and over again. And I know that we've talked about Iracles uh, quite mm -hmm. a lot because. Mm -hmm. To me, I see him as the epitome of what it means to experience that journey of transformation from the soul's lowest conceivable point to the highest. And during even his journeys, he's seen as the epitome of masculinity, of strength, of valor and honor and courage and all of these things. And there are three different points in his journey that emphasize that particular motif. Um, the first of which is the worst imaginable tragedy that he could ever endure, and that consists of the death of his family. And mm -hmm. the myths tell of an instance where he encounters uh, the safe. And he's actually at that point contemplating suicide because he's thinking, what am I possibly going to be able to do from here? I have lost everything that I have. I have no honor as a man. I have nothing left to hold on to. I have no hope. I have absolutely nothing. And it says basically that when Theseus encounters him, he grasps his hands. And in the Greek culture, that's essentially saying, I partake of your sin. I partake of your error. I partake of what you have done that is wrong. And he essentially tells Theseus, you know, let go of me. Allow me to, to sorrow. There's no hope for me. And Theseus essentially tells him, but there is hope because there will come a day when you are in a place where I and all of Athens will receive glory for having helped you. And so you see that element that you were talking about of this kind of uh, redemption, this inspiration to take that moment of the worst comprehensible tragedy and turn it on its head and, and use that to propel yourself forward into this transformation that would ultimately lend him to being credited with the title of one of the most honorable and admirable heroes in the Greek myths. So there's that moment of darkness, of transformation. And Odysseus actually encounters something similar in the Odyssey when he is traveling uh, by ship. And there's a moment when he actually gets uh, thrown overboard because he becomes overwhelmed in this uh, storm. And he has this moment where he thinks, I have prayed to the gods and I have asked the gods to watch over me and to grant me direction and to grant me uh, protection and all of these things. And yet I'm in this situation that I cannot see a way out of. And it says that at that point, he actually encounters um, a goddess of the sea. And she tells him specifically that if you are to survive, you must strip the clothing that you have and you must jump into the sea. 
you must experience that moment of vulnerability if you are to actually survive. So again, we see this motif, this moment of vulnerability, this moment of transformation. And it's in that moment when you release the things that you've held on to in a spirit of complacency, in a spirit of desperation, mm-hmm. that you experience that transformation. It's truly just a, a fascinating it is fascinating. You were telling that, and I was I was trying to figure out which hero in, in Norse mythology you know, kind of exemplifies some of the things you were talking about of, of being that low. Because I, I assure you that there isn't there is a school of thought in Arthurian legend that suggests that that is the journey of a man when you know the, the king, you know, he has a caliber, he has Guinevere, and then the land becomes sick. The king and the land are one, they must go searching for the holy grail. Um, about about 40 to 50, um, there will be a woman raise her head and look at a man and say, what have you done? What have you accomplished? What? And I know a lot of everybody goes through that, what you're talking about, Sydney. Everybody goes through that dark time. Right. <laughs> How do you get out of it? And I'm trying to think, okay, what story is there in, in, the, in the mythology that, that exemplifies that? And... Um, it, it finally clicked and hell it's not like I haven't wrote about it. It, it it's Odin's sacrifice of himself to himself he's here's this here's this deity that is shaped mankind that has built Asgard into this golden age who has has accomplished great things and he's at the top of his very top of his game and right. the, the, the Vanir come along and say hey we you know should worship belong to one or should it belong to all and he gets a case of the red ash throws his spear and gets his and loses the war. Then he has to go wandering. And I and I tell you, I think there's a there's a whole generation of individuals that are literally wandering because they cannot understand the affairs of the heart. The uh the, the ideas escape them of what it might mean. Mm-hmm. Odin sacrificed himself to himself. And that's a real interesting connotation because how do you sacrifice yourself to yourself? Well what is the ego but a per, but the perception we have of ourselves. And it can be great or it can be minimized based upon many kind of societal factors. But to sacrifice that, that's when he that's when he picks up the knowledge of his ancestors. He doesn't learn it before. He doesn't understand how to return and reclaim his rightful role until after he has sacrificed himself to himself. But that feeling of, of destitution, that feeling of loss, of worthlessness, of, of not being just not worth a sack of shit. <laughs> I know what that feels like. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, and it is a tough and, and you know what, it's, it's kind of funny is that people get, people get accustomed to that Sydney. They, they want to sit there and think about those things and they learn right. how to feed off of it. I mean, I'm sure you've seen them, those kind of people that are about my age, they're kind of bitter and shitty all the time. And they, and they just kind of feed off of that negative and always expect the very worst thing. Right. Absolutely. And again, it, it's really interesting because, and this is also a point that I've brought up in criticisms of monotheistic thought overall, but you have the concept in Christianity of a sort of vicarious sacrifice. I was sacrifice talking about that the other day, yes. Someone else. But in our tradition, it's essentially the idea that we offer this sacrifice of ourselves. And again, I know I, I'm kind of repetitive here, but in the yeah. myth of Iris, that's precisely what happens. It's fascinating because he begins at this lowest point, this this point of trauma and tragedy and defeatism. And he goes through all of these labors <laughs> and this entire arduous and difficult journey that, that could not even be imagined uh, prior to his accomplishing it. And then at the very end of his mortal life, it said that he becomes uh, incidentally poisoned. And essentially what happens is that he builds his own uh, funeral here. And he voluntarily lays down in the flames and he essentially sacrifices himself. And from that sacrifice, he is essentially uh, deified and immortalized and he yeah. rises uh, to Olympus to be with the gods. And there's just this, this element of the honor of self-sacrifice. In fact, we see something very similar uh, with Dionysos. 
Um, mm -hmm. There's a very similar instance where he's actually uh, killed and cannibalized by the Titans. And it's said that Zeus struck the Titans with a thunderbolt. And from that intermingling of the uh, Titans and that eternal uh, Dionysian spirit was cultivated humanity. And so there's that element of transformation and change. And despite the fact that that is accompanied by uh, by fear, oftentimes, because we fear change and we fear new things, in going through that process, we cultivate those virtues and those honorable characteristics and attributes that we require to truly be who we are intended to be. And there is a great beauty in that. There's a great inspiration in that. I would submit it's a terrifying thing to be considered to consider being devoured by titans. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and yet I think I think people live under that. I think people live with that fear. And I and I and I think that we watch TV. I did a podcast on it the other day. I think too many men and women perhaps live vicariously through what they see on TV, never cultivating the strength or doing the or doing the reading or having the discussions or taking the action to build themselves. We have become complacent in our in, in our ability to, in ready availability of a vicarious celebration of someone else's heroism um Absolutely. you have to wonder if these kind of ancient pagan thoughts have not re-emerged in in life today to 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 bring us out of our lull of comfort go Absolutely. And, and do you know what i mean go get out there and get in the get in the streets and you know get in a tussle i mean that's the big deal i mean if there's one place where it can all start it's in the actual physical tussle get in the gym pick something up put something down get in there and let somebody beat you up i mean <clears throat> that's i think that's where i think that's the foundation of it i think that's where for men anyway i don't know about women i, I really couldn't say i i wouldn't want to venture a guess that that path is is as alien to me as anything else but that's a, I'm sure there's one there as well. I'm sure there's a, just as much a, a struggle to become a woman in today's society as there is a man, especially in the absence of any kind of a generational passing on of knowledge. Um, Absolutely. I, there's I, definitely an, an element there of, um, of, of, like you said, a fear and of this kind of vicarious virtue, if you will, this kind of pseudo uh, virtue signaling and that sort of thing. And that's all originating from this position of fear because there comes a point where people don't necessarily realize that if you pray to the gods for courage, they're going to put yeah. you in a situation <laughs> where you- are going to get the chance, die. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're going to be put in a situation where you're going to be tempted to be fearful. <laughs> if, you pray, if you pray for strength, you're going to be thrown into a situation in which you cannot afford to be weak. If you pray for these things, you are going to be given the weapons needed to cultivate those things. Those, those virtues, those values in themselves will not be handed to you. And that necessitates change, that necessitates transformation, that necessitates some level of pain because you're essentially outgrowing these things that you've become so accustomed to. And this is also why, at least in the Hellenic myths, um, there's almost this negative connotation that is associated with the goddesses, particularly Ira, which we've talked about previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cast in such a negative light due to this very superficial and materialistic comprehension of what the myths are actually saying, because Ira brings change, she brings transformation, and she brings those necessary confrontations that you require to cultivate those values and those virtues that you need. And so you're going to quite literally come face to face with the things that you fear, the things that you dread, the things that you're hesitant towards because you yourself have to overcome that. And so I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, it's interesting that you say that you're, you're going to have to face it one way or the other. I mean, that's, a, that's the whole story of Frigga and Balder. I mean, she gets everything to promise, don't hurt my son. And I mean, you see mothers that do that, you know, their, their boys are sitting at the windowsill watching the other boys play. She gets everything not to promise to hurt Balder and he begins to use it. I mean, he's a, he's a bad dude. I mean, you ain't gonna whoop his ass. You're not gonna hurt him because uh, everything right. promised not to, but he still ends up on such a radically different journey of masculinity that we have a hard time even 
comprehending that 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 death is a is also a figurative death i think it's no accident that odin has to do it and then his son has to do it as well and both of them you know what that's important too both of them odin hears the song of his ancestors and then he picks up it's almost like the akashic records he picks up the crystallized knowledge of his ancestors in the runes after he sacrificed himself and in journey and Baldur's journey um it's interesting that he goes with someone he loves he goes with nana his partner she perishes in the flames as well and they begin a journey together that is radically different from everything going on in Asgard. It's this entirely new path, but it's also in a realm that contains all of the knowledge of all the ancestors. There's something important happening there. There's something really, I haven't figured it out yet. Probably will, probably by the time I die. <laughs> I'm gonna haunt somebody and tell them all about it. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I think that's, I mean, you, you think about it, though. I mean, all of these, I will say this, though. There, there's a, uh, the, Tyr is this, uh, is this very, Tyr is the original possessor of Gungnir, the original Sky Father. And they, and they want to take it back using the, the proto-Indo-European languages. He is Deuce Praetor. He is the Northern Star. He is the guiding light for princes. But he is not known as a reconciler of men. When you go through the runes, you get to the third et of the runes, the third set of the 24. And it is, those are all runes of powerful transformation. Those are all runes that, Im, I, they're symbols that embody powerful, higher thought. The very first one of them is Tiwaz, and that's Tear. That is, just sacrifice. Tears the one that was willing to sacrifice his hand for the safety of all of the rest. He was willing to make that personal sacrifice for the, excuse me, for the benefit of his community. There's something really important about that because you mean like even like you say, what was it, uh, Hercules in sharing that pain? He will, he, it will bring glory to all Athenians or something like that. Isn't that right? So there's there's something to that. So this. This very grandfatherly figure of Tyr, now he has one hand, but he's he made that just sacrifice for all of his community to thrive, to, to, to develop in a safe environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, it goes on and on. And it's just, um, I know that these kind of conversations are happening amongst other people, Sydney, but I don't know that they're happening. That is a fat cat, man. <laughs> She kind of just uh oh it's oh I see I see it now. I thought it was a black I, okay, it's just a regular cat. I thought it was fat. I was like, holy cow, Sydney. <laughs> it'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's good though, man. And see, I, I think this is the thing that this should happen more often. And it's killing me that I cannot find, and I know that so. You look at the at European culture. You so you, if I look at the mythologies, there's something that kind of breaks down. I see the heart, the passion, the strength, the savagery that is demonstrated in the in the Northern European. I see the high ideas of culture and, and all kinds of other things there. And then you see this see this this second set of higher thought and understanding espoused by the Greeks. And yet you look at Egypt and there's this. There's this literal path into the afterlife that's explored beyond what either of these two spiritualities do. And I cannot find a legitimate practitioner of that spirituality to expand and espouse upon those concepts, which I, I think there's something to it. I think there's really, really something to all of it. Who knows? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one reason why I've kind of started shifting into the direction of comparative mythology overall, because I think that there is just such a profundity to all of these different uh, branches of polytheism and all of these different myths and all, all of this. This. 
Did, did you have something to say on, on behalf of the Egyptians there? <laughs> oh my gosh, it does. It absolutely does. <laughs> That's funny shit. Um, but there, there absolutely is something there that is so profound. And I think that once you start to perceive this in terms of just the totality of divinity and how many layers there are to all of these different myths and all of these different traditions, and, and there's such a mystery in that. And that's something that I'm writing on uh, just briefly in my essay on polytheism is that to be polytheistic is to take a position of humility in the awe and wonder of the mystery of the divine, rather than just to suggest just this one thing, just this one interpretation, just this one emanation. No, it, it's the consideration of all of these paths and all of these mythologies and all of these traditions as these, these windows into this divine mystery. And there's just such a beauty in that. I mean, it's something we spend our whole lifetime or lifetimes, I should say, uh, just studying and, and meditating on. And it's, it's a truly beautiful thing. Um, it is a beautiful but thing. The but the Egyptians have a very fascinating mythology as well. And also, if you look into um, like Alexandria and the Greco-Egyptian culture that emerged out of that and these deities like Ceterpiece, and it's just, it's so fascinating to see how it all blends in so harmoniously. And it's really interesting culture for sure. It's so, and I may create a major faux pas here, but I have the preface to Jack Donovan's new book. And he, uh, we, he, he, we were talking about some of the things you're talking about, but he was talking, he, he made a comment. <laughs> what is, uh, what is man? Is he, uh, is he just watered down the divine? But he wrote something here that is absolutely, I, it pisses me off because he wrote it and I didn't. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, he said, uh, while it is a tragedy that boys come of age without men to look up to, Perhaps it is an even greater tragedy that they have nothing beyond men that fills them with wonder, no vision of perfection. Fuck, that's good. That's very good. I <laughs> know, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I think another good point, in addition to that, um, is that I think that people in the modern day don't necessarily realize the importance of both the solar and the lunar aspects of divinity, and I know we talked about this briefly just oh, the other yeah. day. But yeah. With the solar aspects of divinity for us, that's uh, Helios and and Apollo and um, these these radiant and illuminating aspects of divinity that provide us this understanding and awareness and knowledge and wisdom and these things. With that, I see the external expression of our belief systems and the espoused. Um, declarations of, of our devotion to these gods and these things that are just expressed in an, in an outward manner, in an external manner. But then you have the lunar aspect of divinity, who uh, for us is Selene and Igati and uh, Artemis and these other aspects of divinity that are more intuitive and internal. And that's when you get down to these positions of, of darkness and of doing an internal form of contemplation and work and devotion that is not externally seen by other people. It consists of those moments when you're meditating and you're praying to the gods and you're expressing this devotion on a level that other people don't see and you're cultivating these virtues and these understandings and these things. And I always go back to this metaphor because I find it to be so pertinent to this in particular, to this, this balance that we achieve through both these things um, whether we consider like the solar to be the orthodox expression of belief and the lunar to be the orthopraxic, uh, the aspect that we really invest in practicing our religious uh, devotions. But I always go back to this metaphor of the sun and the moon and how the light and the radiance of the moon is the illuminating solar rays of the sun reflecting upon the surface of the moon and it reverberates across the dark landscapes of the world and the planet and the cosmos. I look at that in the same way where the light of that radiant divinity is seen just as much in the lunar aspect 
in those times of darkness and those times of ambiguity and those times in which we're going through these difficult things and we're going through these formidable uh, challenges and these things. And we still have that light of divinity with us to grant us that direction and definitive discernment. And there's such a beauty and an encouragement in that because when you begin to perceive things in that way, you begin to see, as Aurelia said, all of those obstacles as being opportunities, as paving the way in themselves for you to cultivate those characteristics that we've been talking about. And there's a great beauty in that. There's a great strength in that. And it really does fundamentally change everything about your perception of the world. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't, I haven't pursued it yet for a lot of reasons, but the, the, the actual solar deity for, for uh, Asatru is Suna, is a woman. And for the moon, it is Mani, it is masculine. It's reversed of almost every culture until you get to Japan. And there, and the goddess there of the sun is, is feminine. But I, I, I wonder about that sometimes too. I, I, I wonder, I don't know if you look at it honestly. I mean, what is the great joy of a, of a man? What is the brightness of his life? other than the woman that he loves, be it a mother or a wife or a daughter? What is the, what is the shining thing that brings the smile to the dour face of, of any man who, who's dealing with life? Um, what is it that encourages him to embrace the, the work on the negative aspects itself? Uh, when we would much rather sit around in the, under the neon moon of a bar, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> there's, there's something important in that. But I, I could venture a guess, though I do know <coughs> that when we talked about this the first time, I said something absolutely brilliant. I should have wrote it down. It happens. It does <laughs> it happen. happen. It, it happens all the time. Well, hey, Sydney, I'm going to have to get off here. I got to do a show at eight. I'm going to do this. I got a Zoom meeting and I got a, um, I don't know, I'm either going to be dazzling with brilliance or baffling with bullshit, but it's going to be good. So, <laughs> but as, <laughs> as always, it's good to talk to you. We're going to, we might do some more of these. There's some interesting shit here. But just, I mean, what better fruition of some of Joseph Campbell's work than to find those mythological thoughts in a time that humanity probably needs that help the most? Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, his work is really the cornerstone to that. But I think that, you know, expanding upon that and seeing the practical applications of these things and I think that's the real, that's the real ticket is, is, oh shit, you locked up on me. That's the real ticket is working, putting it to practice. Well, the commonalities that are always with you. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome stuff. I think our responsibility is to put it into actual work that people can do. You locked up on me and I kind of run my mouth for a second. So not everybody heard everything you said, but I think uh, we'll figure it out. We'll get to it. <laughs> hey, it's good to talk to you. It's good to see you too. You take care. Be careful out there. Okay. Will do. You as well, Brian. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.